Since prehistoric times, people knew that a certain amount of fuel always gave a certain amount of energy. Whether burning wood, coal, or oil, the process is a simple chemical reaction. Then in 1896, Henri Becquerel discovered radioactivity. He found materials that do stay hot for weeks. Later, Madame Curie and others discovered that some materials such as radium produce heat for centuries and even millennia. A million times more energy can be produced by radium than by a chemical fuel weighing the same. It's been known since then that radioactivity not only produces heat, but never consumes the fuel. No change would be observed until thousands of years later when the radium turned to lead, with only a minute amount of mass lost in the transfer to heat energy. Radioactive plutonium glows for decades, powering unmanned probes that venture out through interstellar space. If a cold fusion cathode were a typical chemical reaction, it would get hot and within a few minutes it would be consumed. The reaction would stop. In fact, there are no known chemical fuels in the cell. It contains mostly water, which is chemically inert. Water cannot burn. Yet in experiments, cold fusion heat has continued for days, sometimes weeks. The only thing modern science knows that is consistent with this is a nuclear reaction. However, it is conceivable that there may be a process even more powerful than nuclear reaction that physics does not yet understand. That is the mystery of cold fusion. For though scientists have identified telltale nuclear changes in cold fusion materials, they cannot agree on what exactly is this reaction or set of reactions that produce excess heat. Cohesion and condensation into cohesive packages to me is very attractive. But then there are other ones involving various kinds of uh, other nuclear particles. Why coherence effects? Because that allows you to couple the energy of the nuclear reaction to the lattice so you get heat instead of radiation. In addition to being a miracle of allowing two nuclei to get together, it has to be a miracle of changing the pathway that those two nuclei would take upon fusing. Deuterium and hydrogen exists in the lattice as deuterons and protons, so of course you can move them along the lattice with, by imposing an electric field in the lattice. It's also absorbing as much energy from the zero-point field as it's giving back uh, to the zero-point field. And um, essentially a zero-point field is a feature that comes out of quantum mechanics. In fact, this whole area is going to turn out to be just another one of the surprises of the quantum mechanics revolution. That revolution is not over. Lately, I've been able to verify one aspect, one prediction of the latest theory, the polyneutron theory. But even that is, at the present time, a tentative uh, acceptance of the interpretation of the results. My approach is that probably you can transfer energy by pumping small portions of energy, just fractions of electron volts, but doing it at relatively high frequencies. Water, when you nanostructure it, has s some very interesting properties. In particular, it has catalytic properties, we believe. There are various, at least three conflicting uh, interpretations. One of them is just it's some property of hydrogen or deuterium inside matter or it's a property of the particles themselves, which is re revealed by the absorption within solid matter. Well, our critics would say that the problem with cold fusion is that there is no theory to describe it. The problem I is completely different. The problem is that there are far too many theories which purport to describe the same set of observations, and no more than one of these theories can be uh, correct. So we are uh, embarrassed with an excess of uh, theories, which means that it's difficult for me, an experimentalist, to decide amongst the uh, theories to see which one I should examine and uh, test. 
Inside the metal lattice exists a world so spacious and expansive that hydrogen atoms can nest in a virtually one-to-one -one ratio with each atom of palladium. This creates a metastable state which can sometimes release enormous energy. But how that happens is what theorists like the late Nobel laureate Julian Schwinger, MIT's Peter Hagelstein, and other brilliant minds have attempted to explain and therefore reliably predict. It might have 10 to the 10th dimensions. If we are not able to explain the new phenomena in a unique, consistent way, we'll be in deep trouble. So that uh, uh, the only way to, the physicist can go, can do, is to push research uh, and to find crucial experiments. Still, the lack of a theoretical framework does not deter those who see the potential for commercial devices. At the moment, uh, 10 watts per cc is about uh, the maximum we can get regularly. There are odd people here and there who claim much more, and I, I, I believe them, but, uh, you know, how often can they get it? That's the point. Now, were we able to get 100 watts per cc, well, then we would have a, a fantastic... And, and reproduce it. Then we would have a source which would be better than any nuclear energy we've had so far, and also, of course, completely clean, because it produces helium, which is totally, uh, totally harmless. Because the stakes are so great, private enterprise, especially in the United States, is paying close attention to the field. One company that has already begun commercialization is Clean Energy Technologies of Sarasota, Florida. Their Patterson power cell has received over a dozen patents for its unique design, which uses ordinary water and tiny metal-coated beads made of palladium and nickel. They claim to have achieved up to 1,000 times the input power from their experimental cells. We're getting nuclear energy output without the nuclear radiation byproducts. Some of the critics of the technology pointed out that you needed palladium and heavy water. Those are available, but they're not infinitely available. Uh, but as SETI's technology works with hydrogen, or regular water rather than heavy water. And we've also found other elements such as nickel. And as reported at the conference today, some people have found titanium and tungsten that work. And we're just at the start of this technology. I think we'll find a number of metals and combinations that can be used to produce excess energy. In tests sponsored by Motorola, clear excess energy was observed in repeated experiments with the Patterson power cells emitting heat for 11 hours, even after the tiny input electricity was turned off. SETI's power cells have been examined in detail by numerous laboratories, including the French Atomic Energy Commission. Is using small plastic beads, about one millimeter in diameter, coated with nickel, palladium and nickel. Each layer is about one micron, very thin layers. Cold fusion seems to be a surface effect phenomenon. It's not a bulk effect. It doesn't seem to be bulk. That's coming from the surface. So by doing that, you have a lot of surface and little bulk. And because that's something to do, uh, that's something to do with uh, loading of deuterium in the, the crystal. If you start with thin film, you load them much faster. And that's a big surprise. They start producing excess heat almost right away. You know, By the time we do the measurements, there's already excess heat.